Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Skelton and I am the pastor at Dogwood Prayer United Methodist Church as well as Seed Chapel United Methodist Church in Oblong, Illinois and it's a blessing to be able to bring the Word of God to you wherever you may be. As I often start these message recordings, I often start by saying this, is that the Word of God is not meant just for a single day during the week. It's not it's not just meant to be embodied, expre- uh, expressed, and, and embraced and felt on a Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening. Rather, the Word of God is meant to be embodied, embraced, experienced, and felt every day of the week. That's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The Word of God is meant to be e- embraced, embodied, experienced, and felt every day of the week, every week of the month every month of the year, and every year of your life. So whether you're watching this recording the day it is posted or a couple days later or even several weeks later, it doesn't matter when or where you watch this message. All that matters is that God has led led you to this message for a specific reason. And I pray that that reason is shown brightly through the words that he has given me to share with you. So wherever you are, in whatever you may be doing, I pray that this message makes you a better disciple today than what you were yesterday. I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in and to listen to this message, whether you are watching it and listening to it or just listening to it as you as you walk, as you go for a walk, as, a, as you go for a run, as you're doing errands around the house, whatever it may be. I just thank you for taking the time to tune in and to listen to God who has directed you to this message in the first place. So thank you for tuning in. And again, I pray that this message impact your life in a positive way that makes you a better disciple today than what you were yesterday. Before we get started with this message, which is going to continue our message series uh, titled Profit Margins, I want to remind you that in the tradition in which I am a pastor of, which is the United Methodist Church, uh, we celebrate Holy Communion on the first Sunday of the month, and this message is being brought to you uh, on the first Sunday of the month. So at this time, I invite you, if you wish to partake in Holy Communion with me, at the end of this message, I invite you to go around, find something that resembles the body of Christ. That can be bread, that can be crackers, um, that can be chips, whatever you think resembles the body of Christ. It's not so much what it is, but what it stands for that's important. And as you go around finding finding something that uh, resembles the body of Christ, I invite you to find something that resembles the blood of Christ. Right? You can use grape juice, you can use water, you can use apple juice. Um, some people have even used coffee or tea. Um, So whatever you think best represents the blood of Christ, I I ask you to gather that along with gathering whatever you think best represents the body of Christ. And I ask that you just have those ready uh, so when we come to the end of the service, you and I can celebrate Holy Communion together. So I'm going to tell you, you have about 25 to 30 minutes probably to find those elements. So don't get up and rush right away. But if you want to, feel free to. And then take your time coming back or rush back. Either way, so I invite you to join with me at the end of this or at the end of this message to celebrate Holy Communion. We're going to continue today. We're going to continue our message series sermon titled "Profit Margins." We're going to be looking at a different prophet that is on the margins. That is not a major prophet by any means. He's a minor prophet, uh, similar to Amos, who uh, similar to Amos, who we've been talking about these past two weeks. And we're going to look at this new prophet, this minor prophet, and he's going to be teaching us about risky love. You know, God calls us to love everyone. Jesus in the New Testament tells us to love, ev- to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and our neighbor is everyone. Doesn't, it's not just a physical neighbor who is on either side of our living space, but it's everyone that we see in the world is our neighbor. And God and Jesus are calling us to love everyone, and it's really tough to do that sometimes. It is extremely tough to love everyone. And and this minor prophet is put into a situation where he doesn't back down. He doesn't argue with God. He doesn't refute God. He doesn't neglect God's will for him. He goes along with it because he knows and he trusts in God's plan. The minor prophet that we're going to be looking at today is Hosea. And this risky love comes from the realization that he is told 
to love an impure woman, a prostitute. And he doesn't refute it. He goes along with it because that is what God has called him to do. Could we do the same thing? That's the question that's underlining this message today. If you have a Bible nearby, I invite you to turn with me to Hosea, chapter 1. And Hosea, if you're looking for it, because it's not a book you go to all the time, it comes right after the book of Daniel. And believe it or not, if you marked anything um, uh, in Amos, it's going to come before Amos. It's actually going to come before Joel. So it's going to be Daniel, Hosea, and Joel is what you're looking for. So we're going to be looking at Hosea chapter 1. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11, which is all of chapter 1. So if you have a Bible nearby, I invite you to turn with me to Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is what the Lord is saying to this minor prophet. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beri, in the days of kings kings Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah, and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of of Joash of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, daughter of uh, Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, Name her lo Rehama, for I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel or forgive them. But I will have pity on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow, or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. When she had weaned Lo-Harumah, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said, Name him Lo-Ami. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall take possession of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, thanks be to God. Every day, a woman stood on her porch and shouted, Praise the Lord! And every day, the atheist next door yelled back, There's no Lord! One day, she prayed, Lord, I'm hungry. Please send me some groceries. The next morning, she found a big bag of food on her, on her stairs. Praise the Lord! She shouted. I told you there was, I told you there was no Lord, the neighbor said. I bought those groceries for you. Praise the Lord, said the woman. He not only sent me groceries, he made the devil pay for them. (laughs) Love your neighbor, right? As yourself. Last week we encountered a, a different perspective of God's question to Amos. God asked Amos, what do you see? And instead of saying a plumb line, Amos mentioned a basket of summer fruit. Based upon the actions of the people of Israel, this basket of summer fruit wasn't a ripe basket of fruit by any means. Rather, it was a basket of rotten fruit. It was soft, it was discolored, it was withering away, there was flies around it. From this vision, Amos likens the rotten fruit to the faith of the people of Israel. 
Their faith has become rotten, and because of this, God sees their injustices, their oppressions, and their inequalities towards one another. Do you have any rotten fruit in your life that is weakening your faith, that is keeping you from God? After seeing the rotten fruit of the people of Israel, we found ourselves examining the reflection that we see when we look at a mirror. If God is asking Amos to see below the surface of things, then God is asking us the same thing. When we look into a mirror, God needs us to see the creation that he created. The disciple that has been called to bring transformation to the world, the individual that seeks to overcome the fruit of the flesh and, and live into the fruit of the spirit. And the person who, yes, is filled with fear and stress, but is filled with hope, grace, and love. God needs us to see below the surface of things, to see the injustices of this world, to witness the pain that is taking place, and to see the needs of those around us to pay attention to our neighbors. God needs us to see what is reflected in his mirror of creation because he created that reflection in the first place. The mirror on the wall says a lot about who we are from the outside. But the longer we stand in front of it, the longer we allow God to be in our life, the more we begin to see what is inside of us. Essentially, we begin to see what God needs us to see. We begin to see the ripe summer fruit of the basket. We begin to see our, our faith blossom and change the world. When we look into a mirror, what do we see? When you stood in front of a mirror this past week, did you ask yourself, mirror, mirror on the wall? What do you need me to see most of all? Amos and God have paired up to challenge us to think below the surface of things, to, to no longer judge a book by its cover, but to open that book up and to witness the magnificent words that are laid before us. Yes, those words are filled with pain, but why are they painful? Those words are happy, but why are they happy? Amos and God are asking us to see below the surface, to set aside that rotten fruit of, in our life, to make sure that our plumb line is straight from earth to heaven, that our faith is as straight as possible. God and Amos are encouraging us to see the reflection that God has created. The reflection that is truly an example of Christ on the inside. Today we are introduced to another minor prophet who is on the margins of life, who is told by God to marry a prostitute and who learns about risky love in his life. Although this wasn't the life that Hosea, the minor prophet, saw for himself, marrying an impure, an impure woman and naming his children after God's negative relationship with Israel, he trusted in God's plan. Hosea, son of Beri, in the days of kings Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah, and in the days of king Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, trusted God's plan for his life. In accepting God's plan for his life, Hosea, according to biblical scholar Gary V. Smith, submitted his wishes to God's will. He set himself up to feel and to know a little bit about the bitterness of God's plan, as well as the depth of God's love for undeserving people, for unfaithful people. I ask you today, do you love everyone in your life? Do you love all people? If God told you to love a prostitute, a sinner, someone in prison, someone who reviled against you and persecuted you and, and did all kinds of evil against you, would you be able to trust God and say, yes, I love them? Or would you say the opposite? Without any excuses or negative comments, Hosea said yes to God. Could we do the same thing? Could we do the same thing today? 
Following God's plan involves risky love. Let us pray. Dear God of hope, there are moments we feel as though we are separated from you, times where we have chosen our own agendas over you. As we gather to worship today, remind us that despite our wanderings, our wandering souls, you are still home to us. You are still our ultimate trust and guidance. May my words fall to the ground as your words settle in the hearts of all those before me. In your name we pray. Amen. Hosea begins his ministry by being told by God to get married. Hosea, unlike many prophets before him, didn't get a shot behind a podium. He didn't get a a test run speaking to a king or to a nation or to guide anyone at all. He didn't get the opportunity to turn a staff into a snake and lead people to the promised land. He didn't get any of these things. Instead, his first call to prophethood is to get married. However, he isn't told to marry another righteous, poised, spirit-filled person. Rather, God wants Hosea to marry a prostitute. The Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of prostitution and have children of prostitution, for the land commits great prostitution by forsaking the Lord. Hosea had a very untraditional path to becoming a prophet. First of all, how many of you would be able to follow God's plan if God told you to go marry a prostitute? We have all done some crazy things when it comes to following God's plan for our life. We have made decisions that have changed our life. We have embarrassed ourselves for the sake of sharing the gospel. And and some of us have even come to trust a pastor who isn't even 30 years old yet. We have all done crazy things when it comes to following God's plan. But yet, could we do that if he simply stood here before us and said, you have to marry a prostitute? It says in Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths would you be able to follow God's plan trust God with all your heart if God told you to marry a prostitute to do something that you knew in your heart wasn't right but yet God is calling you to do it could you follow and trust God I'm sure some of you would have a few choice words to say to God if if God demanded this from you. But yet Hosea didn't rebuke God's command. A prophet of God didn't rebuke God's command. Don't we all want to become prophets and saints in this life? I don't think we become a prophet or saint if we continually question God. So Hosea went and took Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Second, Gomer, who Hosea marries through risky love, is more than a prostitute. Gomer is a promiscuous woman, according to the NIV, a harlot, according to the NASB, and an adulterer, according to the CEB, and, according to King James, a whore. And the translation we read today, it said whoredom. Gomer is more than a prostitute. She has had many lovers and and who possibly had children with other men while married to Hosea. There's a deeper story to Gomer. Furthermore, the name Gomer is used to describe any chronically debilitated patient admitted to the hospital that has little that has little or no hope for recovery. Not only is Gomer a prostitute, but she is a patient of the Israel people who has reached the point of not being able to recover from her choice of living. There's no point of recovery for her. There's no more hope for her. But yet God is asking a prophet to marry her. Hosea, a prophet of God, a person chosen by God to do God's work, is told to marry a prostitute that is beyond recovery. 
This marriage is beyond risky love, but yet Hosea chooses to love her. Could you do the same? Could you do the same? Love somebody who isn't like you, who is unfaithful, who has a bad reputation. Could you do what Hosea has done and love this person? This directive to marry Gomer comes on the heels of God being frustrated and fed up with the people of Israel and their rebellious ways. Last week we read these words from Amos chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight, says the Lord. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and baldness on every head. I, I will make it like the morning for an only son. And the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming when I, the Lord, will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. God is upset frustrated, angry with the people of Israel. He's willing to take everything away from them because they have not listened to God. They have become of Gomer, a state of no recovery, a state of hopelessness. God wants Hosea to know of this despair, that the people of Israel are possibly in a state of no recovery, Because of Israel's action, God wants Hosea to know the bitter sting of unrequited love. God wants Hosea to know the deep pain of what it's like to see those who once worshipped, praised, and celebrated you abandon you to false gods. This is why God wants Hosea to marry a prostitute, someone who once seemed faithful but lost faith. After all, Hosea's children are named after Israel's deceit towards God as well. This pain is seen in the generations to come. Jezreel, the first son, means God will soon punish. God will soon punish the people of Israel and all those who chose to disobey him. The next child, the daughter, Le Rahuma, means God will have no compassion, no love. This child reveals that God will end his tender feelings of deep affection towards the people, that God's compassionate mercy will no longer be extended towards the people of Israel. God gives the third child the name Loami, which means not my people. Israel will no longer be the children of God. Their identity will change because they have committed themselves to another lover. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. According to Smith, Israel's unfaithful adultery will Israel's unfaithful acts of adultery will lead to the dissolution of the covenant relationship that they once had with God. Not only does Hosea come to love Gomer, but he comes to love his children, who so happen to represent the fate of his own people. Hosea is suffering, but yet he is filled with the love of God. Hosea loves his neighbor as he loves himself. Would you be able to love those who may bring devastation to your people? Would you be able to love those who bring devastation to your family, to your friends, to your loved ones, to those that you are acquainted with? It's tough to say yes to that, isn't it? But here we are, Hosea is not fighting against God, he's accepting it. He's accepting the fact that he has been called to love someone who is unfaithful. He has been called to love his children for who they are and who they represent. Essentially, God wants Hosea to experience the same pain that he is experiencing, to embrace and embody a sense of risky love. 
In order to become a true prophet of God's word, we must be, you must be willing to patiently endure suffering. We must learn how to love all people in all situations, even if we don't want to. Let me share with you a story about loving people, even in the most saddening and devastating moments of life. In 1993, two young men living in Minneapolis got into a gang-related dispute, and one of them shot and killed the other. One was a teenager and the other was 20 years old. The police informed the teenager's mother, a woman named Mary Johnson, that her son, Marlon Bird, had been shot and killed and the police identified the killer as O'Shea Israel. Israel stood trial, was convicted of homicide and was sent to the local penitentiary. Mary said all the right things after her son died. She explained to the people at the trial that she was a Christian. She was a daughter of the church. Thus, she would find peace, a space in her heart to forgive her son's killer. After all, that is what Christians do, or at least that is what they are supposed to do. But as time passed, Mary found bitterness and resentment eating away at her soul. It felt almost impossible to let go of the anger she felt. Mary needed what so many of us need. She needed to be able to pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Praying these words, Mary knew something had to change. Something in her life had to change. She decided to visit O'Shea Israel in prison, the killer of her son. She started their meetings with simple discussions designed to get to know each other. After a while, they became friends. Mary even convinced her landlord to have O'Shea move into the apartment next door. Mary, who could have hated and despised O'Shea for the rest of her life, knew that something needed to change. She knew that love is stronger than hate. If God can love the oppressed, the needy, the poor, the struggling, the rich, the happy, the lost, and the confused, then she could find some way, some way to love O'Shea. It was a risky and bold move. But that's what God needed her to do. To be bold and to listen to her heart. Could you, could you do what Mary did? Love someone who took a loved one away from you. Could you love the neighbor that steals from you? Could you love the person who persecutes you, who wrongs you, who trespasses against you? Could you love the person that takes the last carton of your favorite ice cream off the shelf as you stand before they're getting ready to grab it? Could you love the doctor that may have given you bad news? Could you love the neighbor that repeatedly takes and takes and takes but never gives anything back? Could you ever love the way Jesus loves? After witnessing the pain of the Israel people, God saw a love in them that was seen in the prophet Hosea. He saw a risky love, a love that doesn't come from negative reaction or defeat or grief, but rather from the deep trust and grace of God in their hearts. Hosea, Hosea, although had every right to go against God, God's plan to marry Gomer, he knew that with God on his side there was hope that his love for Gomer could change her heart. It was a risky move, but a move that needed to happen. Chapter 1 of Hosea ends with a similar risky move, a move of restorative love for the people of Israel. Yet the number of people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can be neither measured nor numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall rise up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. God loves the people of Israel so much, 
even though they have sinned against him, that he is willing to stand by them and call them children of the living God. God claims, protects, and loves the people of Israel just like he loves each and every one of you. He protects you, he loves you, and he claims you with his whole heart. If God can love us for who we are, then certainly we can do him a favor and try to love all those in our life. It will be risky. But that's what God needs us to do today. Not tomorrow, today. Mary Johnson concluded her story by reciting this poem. I would have taken my son's place on the cross, said a mother. Oh, you are the mother of Christ, said another mother as she fell to her knee, kissing the tear away. The first mother said, tell me who who your son is, that I may grieve with you also. The second mother said, my son is Judas, Iscariot. Love is risky, but when we come to embrace Christ's love, we in turn embrace both the sin and sinner and the saint and the blessing. When we trust God, our love grows, and as our love grows, we learn how to love more. In a rather famous hymn, we are reminded of these words. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Through trust, Hosea's life was changed and filled with love. Through trust, the people of Israel received God's love, and they were called the children of the living God. Through trust, Gomer's heart experienced unconditional love. Through trust, Hosea's and Gomer's children became known as God sows, my people, and loved ones. Through trust in God, we too can experience a love from God that changes our life. And this love doesn't discriminate, but allows us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves even if our neighbor so happens to be an atheist. We don't decide which persons God should show compassion to. And we do not pick the people who will become the sons and daughters of the living God. God loved the whole world and each individual while we were still sinners. Thus, everyone should expect that God wants to love the sinful and the righteous people just like he loves them. Loving all people will be risky. But if we want to become true disciples of Jesus Christ, then we must follow in his footsteps. Hosea, a prophet on the margins, came to love a prostitute in her sinful ways. If he can do that, then certainly we can love our neighbor. But the choice is yours. Are you willing to trust God's plan and to love his people? Or are you more concerned about your own plan for your own life. The choice is yours. Do you love the neighbor as you love yourself? Gathered around the table with his disciples, Jesus brought forth a love that raises, that raises above all sins, all wrongdoings and all trespasses. This love is unconditional and righteous. It's a love that calls us to take risks, to listen to his words, and to follow in his footsteps, not as, a, not as separate individuals, but as the body of Christ. Around this table we receive a love that will never end, but will live eternally in our heart, mind, body, and spirit. This love is truly divine and wonderful. At this time, I invite you now to partake in Holy Communion with me. I invite you now to gather the elements that you have decided that best represent the body and blood of Christ. I ask you gather those now as we partake in Holy Communion together. On the night on which he gave himself up for us, 
He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Please repeat after me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Please join me in the words that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, I invite you now to consume the body and blood of Christ. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go out into the world in the strength of your spirit, sharing your word and sharing your love for others, for our neighbors, for our friends, for our family. Lord, it's in your name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. As you go about your week, I pray that God bless you with a love that is understanding accepting and transforming and everlasting. May you share this love with all those around you as you take risks, trusting his words as you build his kingdom here on earth. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go transforming lives as you live well and wisely in God's world. Amen, amen, amen. May God bless you this week. May God's love and light shine down upon you and may God's love inspire you to love others. It will be risky. It will be challenging to love everyone, but that is what God is calling us to do. If you choose to be a disciple, a prophet of God and of Jesus Christ, then we must learn to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. May God bless you and may God let his love shine through you. Amen.